morning, Oakwood. This is our third Sunday of meeting basically online. I look forward to the day when we can gather together again in real life, in real time. But until then, this is the way it's going to be. A few things for this morning. First of all, after our worship time, there will be an interview with Keith Anderson, one of the first Oakwood missionaries from quite a few years ago. And then um, I'll be preaching after that. If you would like to, to get the online bulletin or you like the sermon notes, you can sure go online and do that now before the message and print it off. Well, that's up to you. Thanks for being here with us. Hey, good morning, Oakwood. It is a blessing to be with you. We are Tom and Shelley Hooper, and uh, we're coming to you from our home. If you hear clicks and clacks and stuff like that, that's our dogs running around in the living room. If you hear other things, it might be our kids or big diesel trucks coming in. Uh, that's just part of our life here out on the farm. Um, we are glad to be worshiping with you this morning and uh, excited just to see what God's going to do. Uh, we'd invite you to sing along with us as we sing. We'd invite you to be praying with us as we pray. Um, certainly we want to be keeping uh, all the medical people and all of the first responders, especially in our prayers as they put in crazy long hours. For the rest of us, it really does feel, um, as Todd, Elo uh, Todd Jordan put it so eloquently, it feels like a gift from God that he's put us in a timeout. And so we treasure that and we want to um, just recognize that he has given us this time to turn to him and to seek his face and to rest in him and to get away from the busyness and the chaos that distracts us from who God is and uh, takes us away from our hope because our hope is in Jesus Christ and in the blood that he shed on that cross for us. So as we worship together, as we celebrate him together, we invite you just to be a part of our body. Uh, feel free to comment on the side panels and join in in the discussion if you want. Feel free to just close those off and worship with us if you'd rather. Uh, we'll be also hearing a little later from Andrew and Samantha Seidel from their home as they help lead us in worship too. So we'd invite you just to join in. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living i 
Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You return man to dust and say, return, O children of man, for a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday when it is past, or as a watch in the night. You sweep them away as with a flood, they are like a dream, like grass that is renewed in the morning. In the morning it flourishes and is renewed, and in the evening it fades and withers. For we are brought to an end by your anger, by your wrath we are dismayed. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. For all our days pass away under your wrath. We bring our years to an end with a sigh. The years of our life are 70, or by reason of strength, 80. Yet their span is but toil and trouble. They are soon gone, and we fly away. Who considers the power of your anger and your wrath according to the fear of you? So teach us to number our days, O Lord, that we may get a heart of wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long? Have pity on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love, so that we may be glad for all of our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, for as many years as we have seen evil. Let your work be shown to your servants and your glorious power to their children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our hands.
right. Hey, Keith, nice to see you. Been a while. It has been. Good to see you too, Roger. Hey, Oakwood, this is Keith Anderson. Keith Anderson and his wife, Judy, are Oakwood's first missionaries, right? From way back in 79 or 80, something like that, Keith? That's correct, yes. I grew up in Venezuela, went there as a one-year-old, and really my entire life, other than um, my last year of college and my five years of seminary, um, I, uh, I, was, I was a missionary with the EFCA, either as an MK or as a commissioned missionary. Uh, as a missionary kid, I kept getting letters from the national office asking, when are you going to sign up to be a missionary? And I guess 1978 was the year that I, I accepted, and, and we've been with, with them ever since. How did you get connected with Oakwood? Um, it was primarily through seminary. Uh, Pastor Russ Brown and I were in courses together. And so it was through that connection when the church plant started that we were invited to become the first missionaries. And so we went. I believe the church was meeting in a school at that time. It was uh, a group of about 60 or 50 people. I Cushing. Believe. Yeah, Cushing School. So where you are in ministry now, you oversee ProMeta. Tell us about that. It's been a long journey to get to Prometa, although Prometa has been around for 20 years now. We, we started as the Latin America Training Network. It was a ministry of, the, uh, of REACH Global, uh, approved in 1998. It was traveling quite a bit, and I kept bumping into leaders who were trying to pastor churches in Latin America, but had absolutely no training whatsoever. Uh, all what they were preaching were, were notes from Sunday school classes, from sermons that they heard. And a lot of the sermons they preached were repeated over and over again, just for lack of training. And so uh, quite often these pastors would say, you know, is there any way that you can uh, offer to us uh, training without us having to leave our countries, our ministries, our families, and, and uh uh, learning a different language and things like that. The, a verse that, that really spoke, spoke to, to me at that time was, was out of Mark chapter 6, where Jesus gets out of the boat and he sees the multitudes, and um, he, he feels compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And then the next phrase says, and so he taught them many things. <laughs> and I just felt like that's what Prometa has done. We, we, we've uh, just had this heart of compassion to to uh, as we look at, at the Latin Americans, and, and they're like sheep without a shepherd. And they do have shepherds, though, but they're not trained. And so that's where Prometa came from. With this uh, coronavirus, it's like, okay, we got to figure out how to do everything online or to use Zoom or something like that. Um, are you able to do that, Keith? Is this new for you? This week, of course, with all the coronavirus things going on, I've been in a number of meetings, not just with Prometa, but also with Reach Global and others. And uh, a lot of people are scrambling to figure out how to do things online. And this is something Prometa has been doing for 15 years, is we've been doing everything online. Prometa is 100% virtual. If we look at Acts 1.8, and, and we hear Jesus tell us to be his witnesses in, in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost, what has happened is that what used to be the uttermost in Argentina or 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 Africa or whatever, are now becoming the Jerusalems. And they're the ones that are sending out missionaries now. They're the ones that are reproducing what we've been doing for over 100 years. What's your biggest challenge right now as a missionary? A number of logistical issues are, are, are what we would call challenges for us. How do we keep our students in the Middle East anonymous? <laughs> you know, that's just something that I didn't think of when I started thinking about Prometa. Is I didn't think we would have anonymous students. But not only are our students anonymous, the professors are as well. Wow. They can't post their real names on the internet. And so um, the challenge of the internet, computer, security, uh, all those things are, are challenges. Um, I think my greatest joy, without a doubt, are, are to see graduates now assuming roles of leadership, not, not only in their churches, but also in Prometa. Hey, Keith, one more thing. Um, you're a missionary kid. I'm a preacher's kid. Are you surprised that I'm a pastor as I'm surprised that you're a missionary? <laughs> well, you know, you didn't ask me any question about stories, but uh, yes, <laughs> you know, um, had, had you, had you, uh, to, have you, had you told me back in 72 that, uh, 
you would be pastoring a church and that I would be speaking potentially either at the church or through video conference, which obviously didn't exist, I would have been totally shocked. Yeah. All right, Keith. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Okay. God bless you. Bye-bye. I'd like to remind you today that early in the book of Isaiah, it says that in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne. No doubt when a king, one king replaced another, there was a time of uncertainty. Nobody knew exactly what was going to happen. You and I, in the years down the road, are going to look back. We're going to look back on this, this year of the coronavirus, and we're going to say, in the year of the coronavirus, we saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on the throne. We need to be reminded again and again that our God is a God who is in control, that our, our God is one who is still on the throne no matter what happens. And those reminders for you, those reminders for me, come out clearly in the Scriptures. And so I would encourage you in these days, in these weeks, perhaps these months, that you stay connected to the Word of God. As we continue our Gospel according to Isaiah journey, remember, remember that we've already been challenged with these truths. The overarching theme was, there is no one like our God. And you find that again and again in the book of Isaiah. We'll see it again today. I want to remind you that it's this, this transcendent holy God is filing a lawsuit against his people. That his people are rebellious, his people are sinful, and he's going to file the lawsuit, and he has all the evidence. And that's what happens in the book of Isaiah. But early on, we find out that God, God who has all the evidence against us, he wants to settle out of court. In chapter 1, verse 18, we read, Come now, and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be like wool. And we said that what God is trying to do is He's trying to settle with His people out of court. He, he wants to settle out of the court. He doesn't want to punish them. He doesn't want to bring judgment upon them. He wants to grant them grace and mercy. We saw... In Isaiah chapter 7 through 11, we saw that God, in order to, to negotiate this settlement, God must come and meet with us. And that he did that through his son, Jesus Christ. We looked at chapter 7, we looked at chapter 9, those passages where we would call them Christmas passages because it talks about a child to be born, a son to be given, it being born of a virgin. And we know that's speaking about Jesus Christ. We also saw that if God is going to negotiate this settlement, he has to be strong enough to make it happen. Last week in Isaiah chapter 40, as Dr. Kaiser took us through that passage, indeed, our Creator God is strong enough to make this settlement happen. And the question, I believe it's three times in the, in the chapter, uh, chapter 40, who is like our God? Who is like our God? Who can compare with Him? And the answer is, no one. Today we're going to be in Isaiah chapter 42 through 46. And I believe here the prophet is going to demonstrate that God is the only one who's qualified to make the settlement stand. That God's the only one who's qualified to make the settlement official, to make the settlement legal, to make it authoritative, to make it authentic. And while we won't read all these chapters today, I just want to go through and grab the themes. And I trust that you can take time uh, with your online group or you can take time alone uh, by yourself or with your family and you can read through these passages together and find these themes. You see, our, our world has always been looking for the one. We're looking for the one, the one who can come and, 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 and rescue. There, there are blockbuster movies that talk about superheroes, that the superhero comes and, and they do what they do and they save society, they save the planet. But we know that's make-believe. There, there are athletes who come and, and sometimes when they're drafted high, a high draft choice, they come to their team and, and, and people in a, in a teasing way, and yet there's some truth in it when they say, oh, this is the chosen one or this is the one. Other times it's every few years when we have an election year. And, and we, we have to be careful lest we start to think that if a particular person, a guy or a gal gets elected, that that person is the one, they're the, they're the chosen one politically. And it seems like our world wants to accept the one, as long as the one is anybody besides Jesus. And what we're going to find today is that Jesus is the one. The Lord God spoken of here in Isaiah is the Jesus Christ of the New Testament. And so what I, I see here in chapters 42 through 46 is like God is taking the witness stand himself. This is his testimony. 
He's on the stand. He's going to give his testimony. And, and I, I'd like to say it this way. And I quote. Here's what we find. Number one, God says, I alone am the creator. Chapter 43, verse 1. But now, thus says the Lord, your creator, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel. Or verse 7 of that same chapter. Everyone who is called by my name and whom I have created for my glory, whom I have formed, even whom I have made. Chapter 44, verse 24. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the one who formed you from the womb. I, the Lord, am the maker of all things, stretching out the heavens by myself and spreading out the earth all alone. That God's saying, I alone am the creator. That's God's testimony. Second, he, he says, I alone am God. Again, in chapter 40 from last week, it was, who can compare to God? Who is there who can be comparable to him? There's no one. No one. He's God. Chapter 43, verse 10. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, in order that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, and there will be none after me. Chapter 44, verses 6 through 8. I am the first and the last. There is no God besides me. And who is like me? Let him proclaim and declare it. Yes, let him recount it to me in order from time, from the time that I established the ancient nation and let them declare to them the things that are coming and the events that are going to take place. At the at end of verse 8, is there any God besides me or is there any other rock I know of none? Chapter 45, verses 5 and 6. I am the Lord and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. I, I will gird you though you have not known me. A little further down in verse 6, that there is no one besides me. I am the Lord, and there is no one, and there is no other. Verse 14, same chapter. Surely God is with you, and there is none else, no other God. Verses 21 to 22. Declare and set forth your case, indeed let them consult together. Who has announced this from, from of old? Who has long since declared it? Is it not I, the Lord? There is no other God besides me, a righteous God and a Savior. There is none besides me, for I am God and there is no other. Chapter 46, verse 9. Remember the former things long past, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is no one like me. And you might say, well, you know, Roger, did you need to read all of those to us? I mean, come on now, saying it one time is enough. Saying it one time is not enough. That's what God is telling us. It's not enough to say it one time. We need to hear it again and again to understand how crucial this is for us to know that the God of Scripture, the God of the Bible, alone is God. Number three, God says, I alone am Savior. Chapter 43, verse 11. I, even I am the Lord, and there is no Savior besides me. Chapter 45, verse 21. A righteous God and a Savior, there is none except me. And so you and I are very familiar with calling Jesus Savior. And the New Testament makes it very clear that he's the one that comes and he's going to pay for sin. He's going to take away the sin of his people. It's very clear that Jesus is Savior. In the book of Isaiah, here in these chapters, God is saying, I am the Savior. Think of it this way. Old Testament says that the Lord God is Savior and there's only one Savior. The New Testament says that Jesus Christ is Savior. Either then, the New Testament isn't telling the truth, because if there's one God, it can't be both the Lord God and Jesus, unless Jesus is God. That's what the Scripture teaches. Number four, God says this, I alone am the one who can do the impossible. We saw that last week with what we heard in Isaiah chapter 40. Listen to chapter 43 again, verse 13. Even from eternity I am he, and there is none who can deliver out of my hand. I act and who can reverse it. That God can do things that no one else can do. A little further down he says, Behold, I will do something new. Now it will spring forth. Will you not be aware of it? 
I will even make a roadway in the wilderness, rivers in the desert. The beasts of the field will glorify me, the jackals and the ostriches, because I have given waters in the wilderness and rivers in the desert to drink to my chosen people. God's saying that I'm going to put a roadway in the wilderness where nobody goes, where nobody wants to pave a road. I'm going to put a river in the desert which has never been there before. God is the one who does the impossible. We have this coronavirus going on and it seems impossible. Watch what God does. Testimony number five, I alone am the one who can and will forgive sin. I alone am the one who can and will forgive sin. Listen to this verse out of chapter 43, verse 25. I, even I, am the one who wipes out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. Dwell on that one. Go to the next chapter, chapter 44, verse 22. I have wiped out your transgressions like a thick cloud and your sins like a heavy mist. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. That the God alone is the one who can and will forgive sin. Next time we'll be in Isaiah 53. Join, join us next week because we're going to find out exactly how God is going to do it. Truth number six, testimony number six. I alone am the one who knows the future. God says, I, am, I alone am the one who knows the future. Chapter 42, verse 9. Behold, the former things have come to pass. Now I declare new things. Before they spring forth, I proclaim them to you. Chapter 44, verse 7. Who is like me? Let him proclaim and declare it. Yes, let him recount it to me in order from the time that I established the ancient nation and let them declare to them the things that are coming and the events that are going to take place. Verse 26 of the same chapter. Confirming the word of his servant and performing the purpose of his messengers. It is I who says of Jerusalem, she shall be inhabited. And of the cities of Judah, they shall be built. And I will raise up her ruins again. It is I who says to the depths of the sea, be dried up. And I will make your rivers dry. It is I who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd. And he will perform all my desire. Chapter 45, verse 1. Thus says the Lord to Cyrus, his, his appointed, and, and he goes on to say, and there's other places as well where he, God says, I know the future. He talks about this man named Cyrus. This man named Cyrus comes on the scene like 200 years later. He names him. Who else can do that? Who else knows the future? Who knows the future about the coronavirus and how it's all going to play out? We don't know, but God does. And God is saying as he's given his testimony, he's, he's taken the witness stand and he says, I am the creator, I alone am, excuse me, I alone am the creator, I alone am God, I alone am sovereign, I alone am the one who can do the impossible, I alone am the one who can and will forgive sin, and I alone am the one who knows the future. And these chapters remind us today exactly of who God is and why we shouldn't settle for idolatry. It's, it's, it's incredible that that is, that, is, that is the challenge before us even today, that we would settle for idolatry, that we would put our hope in something created rather than the creator. You see, to reject the truth that God is creator is to say, I would rather be an idol worshiper. Because, because an idol is something that is created, and why would we worship that? In Isaiah 44, and, it, and like Dr. Kaiser said last week, it's, it's, it's rather humorous what God says about idolatry. In um, chapter 44, verse 9, Those who fashion a graven image, all of them are futile, and their precious things are of no profit. It goes on to verse 12. The man shapes iron into a cutting tool and does his work over the coals, fashioning it with a hammer and working on it with his strong arm. Verse 13, another shapes wood. He, he ex extends a measuring line. He outlines it with red chalk. He works it with planes and outlines it with a compass and makes it like the form of a man, like the beauty of a man, so that it may sit in a house. Surely he cuts cedars for himself and takes a cypress or an oak and raises it for himself among the trees of the forest. He plants a fir and then rain makes it grow. Then it becomes something for a man to burn. So he takes one of them and warms himself. He also makes fire to bake bread. He also makes a, a god and worships it and makes a graven image and falls down before it. A little further down, it says that, that uh, what he does, not only does he do that, but as he cooks with it, then he even eats the ashes instead of eating what he's, he's cooking. And the end of verse 20, Is there not a lie in my right hand that somebody who's an idol worshiper refused to admit that it's an idol? And even in, in um, chapter 46, 
I, I won't read that part, but in chapter 46, it said, talks about how men carry around their idols. But God says, I'm the one who wants to carry you. In the home place in Kentucky, where Cheryl's folks live, there's, there's a, a, a barn there that dad's had wood like this. This is black walnut. It's nice and thick. It's a beautiful piece of wood. And, and if I would take this piece of wood, and I obviously want to make something with it, but if I would take this piece of wood and I would, I would cut out everything that doesn't look like God, and I would, um, I would, I would shape it and craft it and, and make it look really good so I could carry it around and I could pray to it, and I'd take the pieces of wood that I didn't use and I could make a little bit of a fire, and from that fire I can warm myself, from that fire I can cook, and from that fire I can, you know, eat the ashes, as stupid as that would be. And God's going, it's foolish to be... An idolater, it's foolish to say there is no God. There's, it's foolish to say that there is no creator because that jumps into idolatry. And that's why each of us is called to bow the knee to Jesus. In chapter 45, verse 23, I have sworn by myself, the word has gone forth from my mouth in righteousness and will not turn back, that to me every knee will bow and every tongue will swear allegiance. Right out of the New Testament, but this is written way before the New Testament, where it talks about Jesus, that every knee will bow to him and every tongue will confess, will confess allegiance to him. But the amazing thing here in this chapter is even though we have the testimony of God, well, we, we, find, this, we find this thing said from the witness stand that is just incredible, that, that right, right in the middle of his testimony, it's like he says something that's, that's too good to be true. You can hardly, hardly believe it. Is he actually saying this? And he, he basically says, I want to have a personal relationship with you. And the one he's trying to settle with out of court, he's saying, I want to have a personal relationship with you. Isaiah 43, verse 1. But now, thus says the Lord, your creator, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they will not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be scorched, nor will the flame burn you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I have given Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Seba in your place, since you are precious in my sight, since you are honored, and I love you. Did you hear that? Did you, did you hear that, that our transcendent holy God, Isaiah chapter 6, the creator, the one and only Savior, wants a personal relationship with you, with me? Think of it this, this way. Just like God walked with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, and it says a little later he walked with Enoch, whatever that was, whatever that looked like, just like God want, wanted to speak, and he did speak to Abraham and Moses and Samuel and David. He, he talked to Abraham. He he, 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 it said of Moses that when he spoke to Moses, he did it in a way that was totally like never before where he spoke to Moses face to face. Actually, I believe the literal Hebrew there is he spoke with Moses mouth to mouth, close relationship. He's the one that called out to this little boy and said, Samuel, Samuel. He's the one that spoke to David. He wants to have a relationship just like he did with Jacob where God wrestled with Jacob. You might say, well, I, I want to see God. I want to see God. That would be enough. And I would say, well, you know what? That's, that's an option, but that's totally up to God about whether you would see him or not. Perhaps you would say, well, I want to hear him speak. And I would say to you, that's, that's available, but it's totally up to you. It's totally up to you because God has spoken. He's spoken in his word. That's why we go to his word all the time. He's spoken. It's almost like if we don't listen to what he says in his written word, why? Why? Would he speak to us in another way? But, but here's what I want you to hear that, that God is saying to us today. He's saying it specifically here to Israel. He's saying it to the people of God. But for us today as the people of God, he's speaking it to us as well. Here's the things that he's saying. I have redeemed you. He, he speaks of it in past tense when Jesus hasn't come. Jesus doesn't come for another 700 years. He says, I have redeemed you. He says, I've called you by name. You are mine. Valentine's Day is about a little over a month behind us. And they have those little candies. I think they're called sweet tarts. And, and they come out with, you know, the shape of a heart. And on those hearts, the, 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 the candy will say, be mine. You, you don't give that piece of candy to just anyone that says, be mine. 
Because that, in, that, that says, hey, we're, we, we got a good relationship going here. Jesus says, I've called you by name. You are mine. He says, you are precious in my sight. Read Isaiah 43 again for, for yourself. He says, you are honored in my sight. You are loved. And, and he basically is saying, you are so worth it. He talks about giving a, the, a country like Egypt and Cush, Cush, which is Ethiopia, that he would give away these nations to redeem Israel. Well, wait till we get to Isaiah 53 next week. He gives more than that. He gives his son. And he says, I am with you. It sounds too good to be true. But it says, God notices me. He notices me. He notices you. You ever long for someone to, um, to notice you publicly or to, to notice you unashamedly? calling you by name or treating you like a dear friend. Like if there's a famous actor, or a famous athlete, a politician, somebody, people, everybody knows, and that person would come up to you and say, call you by name and say, hey, how you doing? And, and everybody could see that you're friends. Man, it would just be impressive. And then you'd go and tell a friend that you're, you're good friends with this famous person. And their first response to you would be, no, you're not. You might not be noticed by one of those famous people, but I want to tell you today that you're noticed by God and that God wants a personal relationship with you. He knows us by name and he personally cares for us. Oakwood family and friends, people watching from home, people watching in different states, which is pretty cool. What, I, what I've just shared with you is probably not new to you. If it's new for you, you've never heard the fact that God loves you like this. Then, then I plead with you to place your faith in Jesus. To admit that he's right. He's presenting his case. And when he talks about us being rebellious people, that we're rebellious people, that we're sinful. And he says, I want to settle out of court. He says, I, I want to come and meet with you. And, and if you would come and you would say, God, I want to meet with you. I accept what your son Jesus has done for me. Isaiah 53. He'll change your life. For those of you who've heard this before, you know that God wants a personal relationship with you. My challenge is that at this time you would you would move from your you'd move your faith from theory to fact. That you would move from theory to fact. You see, we know it up here, but how, do we live it? And we're called to live it. And at this time with this coronavirus thing that's going on, we need to let it sink into our mind. We need to let it sink into our heart. We need to let it fill us up with hope that the God of the universe cares for us in the midst of this time of uncertainty. For you see, God's not going to take the uncertainty away. We'd like for him to, but he's not going to take away the uncertainty. He wants us to live in the midst of the uncertainty, whether it's health, whether it's finances, whether it's economy, whether it's job. He wants us to live as those who, who completely trust him. For it's as we trust him, and we struggle, and we wrestle with doing so, it's as we trust him that the worry of the world is defeated. Let your worry drive you to God. Let your worry drive you to Jesus, not to some form of idolatry, because that can't help. The one thing this morning is this. It's time to move from theory to fact. God loves you. It's not a theory. It's not a nice thing to say. It's a fact. Honor Him with the way that you serve Him during this time of uncertainty. Next steps. Memorize Isaiah 43, 1 through 4. Confront the idolatry in your life. What is it that you're trying to use to, 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 to make everything work out instead of running to God? Enter into a relationship with Jesus Christ if you've never placed your faith in Him before. And I would ask you as well to slowly read through Isaiah 42 through 46. Amen. Hey, Oakwood. Welcome back. Uh, this is the time when we would normally take the offering. Obviously, we can't do that right now. But uh, during this time, we would encourage you just to continue to allow this to be a time of worship. Uh, offering is so much more than just giving money. It is not um, about that. It is about returning to the Lord part of what he's given us already and allowing that to be part of our act of worship. And so we would invite you in this time when all of us are a little bit uncertain financially, we're not sure what's going on on what's going to happen, how things look, um, to continue to prayerfully consider what that looks like uh, to give through us to Oakwood's mission here and what God is doing at Oakwood. There's a link just down below the screen that you are always welcome to give online through. You can also um, allow yourself to mail checks if you'd like, um, but 
for us, the most important thing is that you worship, that offering is so much more than giving because you feel like you need to, giving because someone tells you to. Offering is returning to the Lord part of what's his because he is our only savior. Worship with us. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers, they will not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be scorched, nor will the flame burn you. Perhaps you could say, when you go through this coronavirus deal, I'll be with you. When you're fearful, it looks like the water's going to overflow you. It's not. I'm not going to let you be burned. I'm going to take care of you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. You are precious in my sight. You are honored, and I love you. Oakwood, 
Let that carry you and me through this week. See ya.